information that I am, of course, I'm going to be presenting that I prepared for you. Uh, but this is going to be very free flowing. There's going to be um, and probably not going to be the smoothest webinar you've ever heard uh, because it's just me talking. I don't over prepare for these, but I do prepare some points in detail because I know a lot of you guys are looking for some very specific information. You need certain questions answered in order for you to make your buying decision. And that's what I hope to provide here for you today. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the fundamentals of Belize. And even if you've already purchased in Belize or you already know these things, sometimes Maybe you know it, it satisfies your comfort level, but you're not able to explain it well enough maybe to a family member or friends of yours who are interested in Belize. Perhaps questions have been raised about, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this? You know, I've heard this about Belize or I've heard that maybe in a negative way. Maybe you felt very comfortable with the answer you received from myself or just in your research in general, uh, but perhaps you haven't had an opportunity to really think about how you would explain it to someone, maybe that someone you want to invest with, or maybe a family member, a friend who you want to maybe uh, have as your neighbor in Belize, right? So I'm going to go through some of the basics today, few of them in a new light, shed some new light and a couple of changes and updates for you. I'm going to be going through uh, things such as buying real estate in Belize, uh, why there's no MLS, and what we can do about that. I mean, actually how we can overcome that challenge of trying to evaluate different properties. So we're gonna go through different things such as uh, what parts of the country are drawing tourism, what parts are drawing more of the retirement crowd, how that's going to affect your buying decision depending on your own personal likes and taste, where you wanna end up, but also financially, where it makes sense for you to invest financially. So we're gonna talk about a lot of those things today. And then uh, finally, at the uh, towards the end of the webinar, um, I am going to present some brand new listings that I just got literally 45 minutes ago, and this was not planned. Uh, I went to Israel, and I said, Israel, I'm going live in about an hour. What do you have? in and around Secret Beach or other parts of the island that you feel is a good deal that I can present to my clients. So I'm gonna be doing that. And I'm also going to be explaining some different things uh, as, re as regards financing, all right? So there are some very unique things about Belize when it comes to financing that, let me just, let me just say it, it's going to help a lot of us who are investors to look at Belize in a completely new light. I know when I re realized this myself, um, I thought a lot differently about my own holdings and what I might be purchasing here additionally coming up in 2021. All right, so just give everybody a few more minutes to get on. It is uh, just about four minutes to go. And we got some questions. Oh, good, good. So Nadine, happy to have you here. Michael Mitchell, appreciate that. Uh, looks like we got a lot of people on today. Dino, good to see you. George. Heather, James, hey, good to see you, James, fantastic. I know you just got back from Belize. Uh, that's fantastic. John, Kim, all right, Kim, congratulations too on uh, on your little uh, investments. I shouldn't say little, I'm like, you know, your, uh, your holdings in Belize. Owen, fantastic to have you back, Owen. Owen's a fantastic client of ours. Um, can't wait to see you, Owen. Steph and I are looking forward to getting together with you down in Belize here, hopefully in 2021. Rich, Robert. It looks like we have a lot of people on that uh, have invested and uh, or are looking for additional investments and also a lot of you who are just starting the research. This is good. So we're going to have a nice, nice mix here. Charles Roberts, fantastic. Appreciate that. Y'all, uh, tell us where you're from too, if you would, in the chat box. Uh, those of you, hey, Raul and Tahika, fantastic. Excellent. All the way from Ontario. Uh, nice to see you guys on. Oh, New York City. I thought... All right, North Carolina. I don't know if you guys can see uh, who's who's typing the chat box like I can. San Antonio, Texas, fantastic. Just got back from Belize, baby. All right, Rich, that's fantastic. Good, good, we're gonna talk about that too. Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Oklahoma, Washington. Pete from St. Pete, hey Pete. Pete Garion, hey, if anybody's looking for some real estate in, uh, where, where do you sell, Pete? What, uh, St. Petersburg, no, no, yeah, Pete from St. Pete. Anybody looking for real estate in St. Pete, Florida, definitely look up uh, Peter Garion. Great guy. He'll take good care of you over there. Uh, Wade in Massachusetts, Kim in Pennsylvania, fantastic. Oh, property management. Sorry, Pete. <laughs> property management. If anybody's looking for a good property manager in St. Pete's, Peter's your guy. So, um, yeah, email me later on on that. From the UK, fantastic. So we got people from all over the world, wonderful. 
Let me just see. Uh, let's give everybody one more minute because you know how it is. Uh, we're supposed to start right at one o'clock, but people start logging in, then their computer reboots, and then they can't figure out the Zoom link. So just please give everybody just a, just a minute or two more. Russell Grooms from South Carolina. Good to see you on, Russ. This is going to be fun. So what I'm going to do when I start is uh, I do have some things planned to talk to you about, but I also want to make sure that I answer your questions. So I have some slides I've got about a, a hundred tabs open on my uh, on my Google, not Google, on my on my Chrome. So I'm going to be bouncing back before between Google Chrome and um, spreadsheets and PowerPoint, all these different things, just to sort of give you a good overview of what's going to be coming out. But as you have your questions, so for example, if I'm talking for five or six minutes and I'm about to move on to a next point, if you have questions, pop it in there in the chat box. And if it's a question that I'm going to be answering later, I'll tell you. If it's a question I can pause and answer on the spot, I'll do that as well. And if I don't know the answer, well, I don't know the answer. I'm not going to make something up. I'm going to do my own research and get back to you. And uh, so we can all have uh, accurate and the most up-to-date information. All right, Kevin and Patty from Arizona, White Mountains. Great to have you on. This is going to be fun. All right, so let's begin. It is 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Welcome. My name is Dennis Kay with Belize Islands Real Estate. Most of you I have never met in person before, uh, but I feel like you know you. A lot of you I've had on Zoom calls. You bought me coffee. You've been watching my videos, so thank you very much for that. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know me or have never met me before, maybe you've never even seen my videos, uh, let me just, just start off with some of the basics. All right, so let's go. So my name is Dennis K, spelled K-A-Y, not to be confused with the key, C-A-Y-E, Ambergris Key. But uh, my wife and I uh, were looking for a country to move to. This goes back to 2001 and 2002. And uh, I had no desire uh, at all to leave the United States. And I, this isn't going to take very long, guys. So I don't think I'm going to be long-winded here. But you should know who you're dealing with. So 2001, 2002, I was uh, born and bred in Michigan. And I had no desire to leave. It was my wife who actually wanted to go abroad and travel the world. And again, even then... I had no desire to even even travel to other countries, let alone live in them. Um, but, you know, the saying, happy wife, happy life. Over a period of time, she convinced me to give it a try. And I said, okay, I do have some criteria. Um, I don't know much about other countries of the world. Um, but wherever we move to, I'll give you one year. I want it to be safe. I want it to be English speaking and relatively close to the U.S. Because to be honest, I was afraid to, uh, to travel uh, that far away. So, we found, uh, I shouldn't say we, she found the country of Belize, came to me one day with a stack of papers and said, hey, I found us a country to move to. It's called Belize. I said, great, where is it? She said, uh, Central America. I said, yep, no way, because all I could think of was like Che Guevara with bullets strapped to his chest and camouflage running around the jungles. But we uh, agreed to go down and at least check it out. And I tell you what, I think it was July 3rd, two thousand and. 2002, we went for a three-week trip to spy out the land, absolutely fell in love with it. It was nothing like I imagined. I, I loved everything about it and went home. This is in July 3rd, 2002, uh, sold off everything, sold the boats, cars, homes, everything we had. And uh, July 3rd of the following year, we moved to Belize permanently. So we lived in the mainland for two and a half years, the islands for several years, and uh, as you may know, right now we are splitting our time between Europe and Belize. So I'm coming to you live, not from Belize, but from France. Uh, we live in Strasbourg, France, spent five years in Paris, now Strasbourg, but go back and forth to Belize. That's where my team is. And that's one of the purpose of this webinar is to introduce you to some of my team. So we have had a fantastic run in Belize, uh, got involved in investing ourselves and selling real estate in Belize in 2006 and a half just about before right before the crash hit. and uh, But since then, we've had a, an amazing time. Uh, I've been able to be on several uh, TV shows that highlighted Belize, HDTV, House Hunters International, uh, the HDTV show Live Here by This. I shot three episodes of those. Great, great show. Um, also been on several investing podcasts that have highlighted Belize. Just, just had a really, really good time. So listen, if... If you're going to be in Belize in the next one to two months, and Steph and I aren't able to get back yet, so you're wondering, well, who's going to show me the property? I know you, Dennis. You've been, you know, giving me all these videos, but who's actually going to meet me, show me, and 
Basically, will they take good care of me? Well, absolutely. So here's part of my team. Israel Barrientos, local Belizean guy. You see him here, good looking guy. He's a lot of fun. Not only is he a lot of fun, but he knows the island better than anyone else I know. Even This even includes realtors because a lot of real estate guys, they will know uh, certain pockets of, of property owners. It's, for example, if they specialize in homes, condos, islands, vacant land, Israel knows all the expats. He knows all the locals. He's related to them, half of them by marriage or by, by friendship or common law, whatever. So Israel is your guy. He'll take you around. He'll find you the best deal. I've got nothing but rave reviews. So he's going to be the guy. If I'm not there personally, he'll be the guy to take you around. Obviously, if I'm there, then I'm going to have that privilege of taking you around, showing you around. Also, a guy I want, want you to get to know is uh, Dominic Leonard. Dominic works with me now as uh, one of my executive assistants. He's German. He actually lives in Sweden right now. Uh, but he's been doing a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes with the members-only platform. So if you're part of that, you need uh, to congratulate Dominic because he created this entire web uh, members-only platform for us which is just a fantastic tool many of you are using. He's created a lot of personal dashboards for myself. And he's also now taking on the role of starting to do preliminary Zoom calls. So for example, if you want to jump on a Zoom call with me and you have a bunch of questions, uh, before you know, we jump on a call together, uh, Dominic may give you a quick call, spend five or ten minutes with you uh, just to get your list of questions ready so that I can enter the Zoom call prepared. All right, Alberto Villanueva, this is the guy who handles all of our closings. We have kept him busy this past year. Alberto is uh, the owner of Belize Key Investments. They've been in business 18 years. Uh, I 100% trust this guy. Not only is he a good friend of mine, business associate, but he just takes really, really good care of all of our clients. So you're going to be able to meet Alberto when you go on the island. And if you want to go a step further and meet with some builders, designers, you can meet with Arcel Martinez. Uh, he handles the design and construction oversight for several of my clients. So you're going to be able to meet a lot of these guys uh, when you go there if I'm not able to be there personally. All right, so we're getting some questions coming in. So let's just go to answer them. Um, the recording will be on the members only site. All right. So uh, yes, Dominic, Dominic will be uploading that. And, uh, uh, another question here, comment here from Rich, Rich Wilkins. Rich says, just spent the day with Israel and he was outstanding. All right. Very nice. So another question by Marsha Johnson. Do you prefer we put our questions in the chat box or a Q and A box? Uh, Marsha, this is my first time using this. So just put them in the chat box. Um, I can just kind of scroll through there and they'll come right up for me. All right. So there's a couple of things that uh, I, I want to go on to. Um, let me just kind of go back to my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, all right. So first of all, why Belize? Now, even if you've already decided on Belize, all right, I, I think it's really important that if you're buying and owning property in a foreign country or planning on moving to a foreign country or spending, you know, months, a year in a foreign country, there are some things that I personally feel are way more important than the palm trees and the food and the reef and all that kind of fun stuff, right? To me, I think it's important that you look at the foundational pillars of the country, especially when it comes to investment. You know, obviously, you guys are taking your hard-earned money that, you're, that you've earned in the UK or Canada or the United States, and you're entrusting the, the, that money to another country based on their laws, their property structure, their ownership rights. So for example, when you're looking at different countries to invest in, like you know uh, Costa Rica, Panama, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Belize, Portugal, Greece, other countries, you really gotta do your homework because not all structure, not all countries obviously have the same foundation when it comes to their government, their structures, how property ownership is conveyed, uh, you know, for example, let me just do a share screen here with you on the issue of what law structure the country actually has as its base. All right. So let me just pull up a quick website. It's right here. So this is just uh, Wikipedia uh, called the List of National Legal Systems. So I'm not going to belabor this and go into, the, into this into a lot of detail, but this is something that I've studied in detail myself, and I know a lot of investors who are pumping in millions of dollars into Belize, they really make it their, uh, their, their, their goal to understand really what is the legal structure of a country. So for example, there's civil law, common law, statutory law, religious law, and a combination of the two. So when you look at some countries that 
uh, might appeal uh, to Americans and Canadians and moving to, you find that their structure is based on Napoleonic law or, or Germanic civil law. Uh, for example, here, countries such as Costa Rica, very popular with North Americans, right? So you have Dominican Republic, again, based on Napoleonic civil law. France, Napoleonic Code. When it comes down to other countries, oh, Honduras, the same thing. So we just mentioned three countries uh, or four that are very popular with Americans wanting to move to retire and invest in those countries, but they have a completely different law structure and property structure uh, than we're used to. Now, going to uh, British common law or English common law, that's what the United States and Canada is based on. This is a law structure that, that we're really familiar with. Whether we realize it or not, whether we can you know explain this in detail, what this means, but you see here Belize is based on English common law, the same as the British Virgin Islands, the same as Canada, the United States, Ireland, uh, other places, you know, New Zealand. We have, you know, just all of the countries that we're more familiar with are based on English common law. Now, what does that actually mean? It means that the way they structure their laws, even when it comes down to property ownership, the transfer of title, the guarantees and protections. So, for example, uh, a Canadian or an American can come down to Belize. They can buy property, own property. They can own it in their own personal names. They can own it in a Belize Chapter 250, whatever. But they are guaranteed the same rights and protections for that ownership as a, as a natural Belizean would, as a, as a person who was born and raised in Belize, has a Belizean passport. So the government is not making any distinctions. This is very different when it comes to property laws or structures, for example, in Mexico. Mexico, which is makes it they, they, they make it easy uh, to own property own we say own but oftentimes it's just a 99 year lease you don't actually own the property you have to have a a local be 51 percent owner of the company there's a lot of things going on with that not saying that that Mexico might not be a good investment but if I'm buying something in a different country I want to make sure that I can own it fully all right so that's one of the benefits that comes uh, with Belize. That's one of the foundational p pillars. Also, what I like is that English is the is the main language of the country. Now, you might speak other languages, so it might not be a problem for you to go to Ecuador, or Honduras, and, and deal with, 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 their, with their system, but a lot of North Americans don't speak Spanish or don't speak another language. So for them, being able to come down to Belize and go into any doctor's office, any hospital, any bank, any lawyer's office, read any um, real estate agreement, right? And have all of that to be in English without having to be translated, there's just a huge benefit in my mind and a huge protection. Also, we see that the protected areas and the rights and protections that Belize has set up. So for example, a lot of people are asking, what, what is Belize doing to protect what it has? And in other words, is it going to be overgrown is it going to become something like a Cancun or Playa del Carmen? Is the, is the progress that it's making, the development that we're seeing, going to get out of hand so that it ruins its natural beauty and the reason why people go there in the first place? All right, so that's a very legitimate question. So let me answer that by going to this website right here. So let me just go through a couple and find the one I'm looking for. Uh, right here. All right, list of protected areas of Belize. So let me just, let me just, I'm just going to go through very quickly. I mean, a maximum of two minutes on this, but I encourage you go to Wikipedia, look up this list of protected areas in Belize. Belize has set aside 26% of its land mass to be completely protected, either part of national parks, marine reserves, United Nations World Heritage Sites. You know, we have all these places uh, there are several, you know, major national monuments in Belize, lots of nature reserves, wildlife sanctuaries, and a lot of those are around Ambergris Key. You know, the reason a lot of you are on today, you want to know more about Ambergris Key. Uh, but so when you look here, you have, uh, let's go down to the marine reserves. So you have the Bacalar Chico Marine Reserve. That's on the northern part of Ambergris Key. That's 15,000 acres, right? You have the Key Calker Reserve. You have the Glover's Reef. You have Whole Chan, which is 3,500 acres. That's just off the uh, the uh, east coast of Ambergris Key. Um, you just have so much going for it. So Belize has really done a good job at making sure that it's not going to be overdeveloped, right? And and one of the things, too, you got to look at in Belize is that 
compared to a place like Cancun or Playa del Carmen or Tulum, those, those places are able to boom like they are because those were created by the government of Mexico. You know, going back into the 70s, there was nothing in Cancun. The government of Mexico actually said, we want to create mass tourism. What area of our country has the best weather, the best beaches? Where can we pour billions of dollars into and just force the growth? And they've done that with Cancun, Playa, Tulum, awesome places. Stefan, I love to visit those places. Belize is at the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Belize government doesn't have any money. <laughs> I'm just being straight up. They don't have funds for infrastructure, all right? So they can't just pump millions of dollars into an area. They don't, for the most part, build roads, put in infrastructure, put in electricity, put in water systems. A lot of these are done with private money, <coughs> developers, individual owners. And so that right there limits the amount of growth but also, there's an inherent absorption rate in Belize. We can only absorb so much infrastructure coming in at one time. We can only absorb so many uh, properties transferring hands, right? Everything kind of has to go through at, a, at the pace that Belize allows for, including building. So, for example, when you come down to Ambergris Key, you might see hotels, resorts being built, and it might take them five or six years to build, where in the United States or Canada, that might be a one-year build, done, right? So it's it just grows at a lot slower rate. So where are we going with that? Let me just see if you guys had any questions. All right. Um, uh, okay, I'll answer that question later, Parrish. Excellent. Let me just go back to my uh, PowerPoint here. All right, so what now once you get those basics out of the way, right? So why do I feel... Belize is getting so much attention right now. Well, first of all, I think those are the reasons I just told you where you that you should seriously consider the foundational pillars, the government structure, the property laws, uh, how English is is the main language. Then you start to look at okay, now what is the kind of lifestyle I'm going to be enjoying, or what is the financial returns if you're an investor? So first of all, the weather. Obviously, I don't need to tell you about the weather. If you want to know what the weather's like in Belize, just come down. It, um, it's, it's really awesome. If you like swaying palm trees and warm, balmy weather and being able to snorkel, dive, and fish, and sail, and swim in the ocean year-round, Belize is for you. The lifestyle, extremely laid back, all right? Not fast-paced, not, uh, not busy, Yet, in some areas, you're still going to find enough to do so you don't get bored. Belize also offers tremendous adventure. Go back to that Wikipedia site. Look at all those areas that you can visit, the wildlife sanctuaries, the bird sanctuaries, all those different Mayan ruins, the, the jungle re, uh, reserves, all that kind of good stuff. There's just so much adventure happening in Belize. And also, people are coming down to Belize uh, basically to escape. You know, let's just be honest, 2020 has been quite the year and we are seeing a lot of migration and immigration take place uh, within the United States and Canada, but also going abroad, you know. So, for example, here's just some teaser pictures. Uh, these are pictures of Ambergris Key. Uh, if you can see yourself here, um, that you're, that's why you're probably watching this webinar today. But let's just kind of go to the to the why Americans and Canadians are moving. We're not going to leave the Canadians out, but... We see that immigration is taking place, all right? So, for example, 2020, we see people are obviously leaving certain states. New York, California, Ohio. Now, why is that? Well, some of that is politically motivated, right? Some of that is motivated by, by taxes or um, you know, business structure or opportunity. But we see, that obviously, there, there is migration going on within the continental United States, but we're also seeing people taking it a step further, all right? So they are saying, I don't want to just go from New York to Florida. I don't want to just go from California to Florida. I want to go abroad because abroad is where I think I can really escape the madness, all right? Where I think there's going to be some opportunity. So, for example, when you look at how many people, uh, how, many, how many more people today are willing to look at retiring and investing abroad compared to even 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, the number is outstanding. So for example, right now, the United States Social Security Administration 
uh, sends checks to 700,000 people living outside the United States in the foreign countries. And it says that that's a steady 40% increase over 10 years. Uh, that was before COVID. That was before the pandemic, right? That was, uh, these numbers here go back to 2019. And what these are looking for in a country is everything we just talked about. Adventure, better quality of life, maybe a lower cost of living, cheaper taxes, better weather, all that kind of stuff. And so we're seeing a lot more people start to look at Belize in a very serious way. In fact, you know, since since the pandemic hit uh, in March of 2020, we've seen an 800% increase in the amount of inbound traffic of people looking to buy, invest, and move to Belize. So before I go into this screen, let me just check and see what kind of questions have been coming in here. Uh, question, three years away, says my wife and I are likely three years away from being able to invest in retirement property. Do you think prices across the key will be far higher than they are now? Um, yeah, absolutely. No doubt about it. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why here in a little bit. Uh, but I don't know if you need to wait the three years because you think that you're not going to have the funds ready until the end of the three years. If there was a way now that you could finance a property and get in with low money down, would you consider buying today rather than waiting for three years? And I'll kind of go over my reasoning on that here in a little bit. Um, Kim, does having a Chapter 215 owning property in Belize change the 50-week requirement for residency? No, it doesn't. In fact, I'll go into that later as well. Uh, has the influx of people, Nadine, thank you for the question, by the way, for all of you, Kim, uh, Michael, and Nadine, has the influx of people affected building cost? Yes, it has. Absolutely. Building costs have gone up. There is uh, Building materials now are in very high demand. There is a boom in building. Um, and there, yeah, there definitely costs are going up. Um, do you see many people taking home equity loans to buy property? Yes, I do. In fact, that's one of the great things um, about living in the U.S. and Canada is if your house has some equity in it, you can pull the equity out, put it into Belize, and uh, either you know at least get in on on the ground floor now with your land, if not being able to finance your condo or home or your ultimate retirement property. Um, but that, that is a very good question. <clears throat> uh, Laura and Bruce, you mentioned privatized infrastructure funding, but has the infrastructure been enhanced and developed along with all this rapid development and not just places like Secret Beach, but for local Belizeans in their neighborhood? <clears throat> Hang on one second. <clears throat> so local Belizeans, that's a great question, Laura and Bruce. And, um, yeah, so, so the answer is the government has no money, period. And so Belizeans in local neighborhoods that count on government funding for things like infrastructure and roads and services and amenities, no, I mean, I'll be very honest with you. They're, they are, um, they don't get access to a lot of that. Property taxes in Belize are very low. Everybody loves this point. Oh, I love paying next to nothing in property taxes in Belize. Well, guess what? Low property taxes for everyone means the government doesn't have much money, right? How, how do you how do you fund things like infrastructure and roads if it doesn't come from some sort of taxes? Uh, in Belize, the income taxes are extremely low, right? And so if you have low income taxes, low property taxes, no capital gains taxes, everything that makes us North Americans go, wow, this is awesome for us, right? Well, it's not so good for putting in infrastructure and things into local neighborhoods. So we can talk about that later, but that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, question from Marwa. Do you have an insider that can help get us a lump sum from our pension fund? Um, yeah, so we can talk about that a little bit later, um, Raul. I, I imagine you're talking about your self-directed 401k or your 401b. We can talk about those as well. Um, why aren't foreign homeowners tax at a higher rate or, or any properties in a certain price range? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, Laura. So when I'm talking about lower property taxes, this is the thing in Belize. They're not going to tax me more than they are local Belizeans. So as an example... Let's say I own a beachfront house uh, on uh, the south side of Amberdish Key. My house is worth 500000 And next to me is a Belizean who inherited that property from maybe their, their parents or grandparents, and they were able to build a home, and their house is also valued at $500,000. Look at the differences, though. Uh, we both get taxed the exact same, right? 
it's not fair to me to pay higher just because I'm an American and have the Belizean pay less, right? So that's one thing in Belize is everybody is taxed the same. Now, where the government does make a good amount of money is through their stamp tax. So for example, if an if an, a foreigner buys property, he normally pays an 8% stamp tax. I say normally because there it, it really depends on the property that they're buying, how it's titled, how it's structured. But normally we can count on 8%. Belizeans only pay 5%. So there is a little bit of a, a reduction for them. So if a Belizean buys a property from another Belizean, 5% stamp tax. Americans, Canadians, Europeans, we're going to pay 8%. That 8% is a one-time fee. That really does provide some good revenue uh, for the government of Belize that they can do things with. But you can see not, not that high of revenue. All right. Thanks a lot for the questions, guys. Really appreciate that. Let me, let me go back to this for a minute. So we're, we're, when we're looking at, you know, why Belize is getting, getting the, the heat right now, why is it heating up? Because when you look at the 328 million people that live in the U.S. and the 37 million that live in Canada, you know, we have, uh, what is that? You know, 350 some, 360 million people that live right here. And if they're looking for a country to move to, where number one, they feel it's safe and secure and they can own property. Number two, it's got great weather. Number three, it's English speaking. When you look at this entire area from Mexico down to Panama, there's one English speaking country in Central America, it's Belize. When you go into South America, there's one English speaking uh, country, it's uh, Guiana, British Guiana, which sits, I think it's right here, right here, one of these, one is French and one is British. So you have two countries, to be honest, British Guiana does not get people moving there. It doesn't get the retirees. Um, Belize is that one country that people are looking to go to. So that's why we're seeing such this massive uptick, right? So for example, if you were to go and just type in, you know, what is, what is a great country for an American to move to? best places to retire. So for example, I went to the guys at International Living. And remember, all these articles that you guys see online, whether it be in Forbes or on CNN or International Living or Escape Artists and all these, you know, the, these are all written by people that oftentimes ha have a certain bias. They're, they're, they're selling something, whether it be the report on the country they're featuring. But just check this out. World's best places to retire in 2021. And, and this is based on, on an American, the North American market, all right? So what do we have here? We have Vietnam, all right? Um, I've never thought about retiring in Vietnam. I, I don't know if many Americans would, but Vietnam is certainly an interesting country. Uh, they go ahead to make a, a good pitch on why that is. Malta, all right, you have Malta here. Uh, France, all right, I live in France, so you know a good portion of the year I'm here in France. I can see why France would be attractive to a lot of North Americans. Malaysia, uh, that's that's an odd one for me. I, I don't know of a lot of Americans wanting to live in Malaysia. Ecuador, all right, cost of living is in Ecuador is actually very reasonable. You know, so I do know some American friends of mine who have moved to Ecuador. Portugal, all right, a little bit cheaper. You're still in Europe. Colombia, all right. What else do they have to say? Mexico, of course, Mexico. Mexico is is, is still pretty popular. All right, and of course you got Panama. Oh, uh, that Panama looks a lot like New York City to me, right? So, um, and of course, they all have their pros and cons with, with each of these each of these areas. But here's the thing. Belize is close to the United States, very easy to get to for most of us, all right? Again, for all those pillars, all those foundational pillars, it meets our needs. And we don't have to fly 14 hours or more with layovers to get to places like Malaysia, uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, all these places. Uh, for example, I know when I'm in Belize, you know, full time, if I need to get back home, to, something happens to mom and dad, or we need to get back home quickly, boom, I can be on a plane that afternoon. I can be back to the United States. Or when I'm doing business, a lot of you guys who are looking to move to Belize, you're still operating businesses back home, either remotely online, or maybe you are doing it through, um, maybe you have a team back in North America that you're communicating with regularly, just to be in that same time zone, right? That, it saves a lot of hassle. So uh, those are all reasons why Belize is getting a lot more attention right now than it did before. And as you can see that there's, there's a lot more activity in Belize. All right, let's see if we have any questions coming up. Um, all right, I'll answer that later. Let's go back and continue on. 
Um, yeah, so why Belize? Just a quick review, guys. Why Belize compared to Costa Rica, Panama, Mexico, Dominican Republic? Ease of doing business in everyday life. Immigration opportunities with the QRP program uh, or just immigration opportunities, period. All right. You can just show up in Belize and stay and never leave. Other countries. You no. Know, and that's what that's what people don't understand. People, people oftentimes and, and they do this when they're upset because of one thing or another. Say, you know what? Um, I'm I'm leaving the United States. I'm leaving Canada. I'm moving to X without realizing that they just can't move to another country, right? Countries don't just open the doors and allow you to come and stay. You have to meet certain requirements. You have to apply. You have to show proof of income. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. Belize, from everything that I've compared, and every other country in the world, Belize has the easiest immigration policy of any country I've seen, hands down. You can also work there. You can own a business. English being an official language has opportunities. Now, which areas might be the best for you. Well, I've talked about this at length in other videos. So I'm not going to go through each of these areas, but Corazol, Placencia, Kyle, Amberger's Key, they all have their, their pros and cons depending on your personality, your budget, your lifestyle. So again, I've gone through this before. Uh, this is a, These are pictures of Corazol that sits on the Mexican border. Uh, Placencia is on the mainland down south. Okay, pretty nice area down there too, but it still is mainland living. The Cayo District, you have the uh, the jungles uh, of Belize. You have a lot of rivers. You have waterfalls. The, the cave systems are amazing there in the Cayo District. Kikalker is Ambergris Key's sister island. Also a nice little island to, uh, to live on. Very quiet, very small, uh, beautiful, beautiful place. And then finally, Ambergris Key, which is the island that many of you are looking at. And so for the rest of this webinar, I kind of want to dig into some questions that have been coming up lately regarding Ambergris Key and how it's different than other parts of Belize, why that is, and some things that we just may not have uh, have thought about before. So before I do that, let me uh, let me go back so I can see we got some questions coming in, and then we'll just start to go through this little list here. So let's see. Oh man, you guys are popping the questions. All right. Um, could you summarize the pros and cons of each area, Nadine? I will. I promise you, I will. We're pricing on goods and goods. Okay. All right. So. Listen, you guys got a lot of questions. I'm going to answer them all. We've been at this now for about uh, 31 minutes. What I want to do, because I will, I will answer all your questions, I promise. But what I want to do is give you some information right now that really applies to Ambergris Key. And it should interest you if you're a property owner on Ambergris Key or thinking of being one or you want to live there, open a business. And I'm going to start with this. Okay, so first of all, uh, this question about no MLS in Belize, all right, that that's an issue. Number one, that there is no MLS. Number two is that there is no MLS. There is, there are no, I shouldn't say no. There are very few property websites, real estate agents websites that are well-maintained and that are up-to-date and that don't have old, outdated listings on them. And part of it is just maybe training, uh, myself included. There's some old stuff on our website that I just need to go on there and take down, all right? Uh, but there, there are other issues that are coming up, other things that are causing issues. As you guys do your research on Belize Real Estate, you're coming across old, outdated information, properties that sold six months ago, two years ago, five years ago. And this is sort of... I should say, sort of warping your view of what the current market is really like, all right? So that's why I try to push a lot of my listings out now through YouTube so I can give you accurate, up-to-date information. Just let, let me give you an example by what I mean like of this. So let's go to, um, let's go to Google, and I want to show you something right on my screen. Um, okay, so open up a new browser. If we just go Belize MLS... All right, let's see what comes up. I told you there's, there's no Belize MLS, but it says right here, Belize Real Estate MLS.com. All right, so let's click on that and see what this is. Let me see if this comes up. All right, so this is a website. It is not an MLS. What it is is that the owner of this website has gone to other real estate agents' websites 
and they have selectively pulled off listings and things that they feel they're they're basically they're they're, they're attracting leads through here, right? And more power to them, you know. Um, but the problem is a lot of these listings uh, are old and have sold a long time ago. So for example, here is one of my personal listings, parcel number 8642 at Secret Beach. All right, so if we click on that, it shows the price as 185. Here's all my pictures, all right? There's my sign on the property. Um, this is my write-up, all right? The problem is uh, this sold January of 2020, all right? It's even got my video on there, right? So this sold of January 2020 for 185. So the problem is if you guys are, are researching websites, you go, hey, Dennis, I saw this listing on the MLS for 185. Yeah, that was the prices 14 or 15 months ago. Right now at Secret Beach, the last four or five properties that we've sold have sold between 235 and 250. And right now there's nothing left available under 275. And I say, well, Dennis, why would that be? What would happen in 12 or 14 months to make a property go from 185 up to 250 and 275? Easy. You know what happened? There was a road that was built. So for those of you who are used to seeing my Google Earth overlay map, just check this out. And Google Earth hasn't even updated. But those properties that I was just referring to, all up in this area, all right? So one sold for 185. One, you know, These are now selling for 250, 275. This road now has gone in. So all of these beachfront properties, second row and third row lots, now have road access. Now what happens when a property that was previously boat access only, all of a sudden has road access? The prices are gonna skyrocket. They're gonna go through the roof, you know? It's because right now, people that wanna have a beachfront property that wanna have road access, before that wasn't an option, now it is. So guess what? Prices just went up, all right? If we go back to the whole MLS thing that, 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 that you know people are looking for. So, right? so that's just one example. But this website here is full of examples like that. Let's just go back to our Google search here, typing in Belize, uh, Belize MLS. And let's just see what comes up. What else comes up? All right, so we have the point two homes. Point two homes, what, what that is, is that is a, a template. That is a real estate website template. And some agents choose to share their listings with each, with each other, but that is definitely not an MLS. Uh, we also have this here, uh, MLS in Belize. Let me see what this one is. All right, again, uh, this is, this oh, this is a Remax website. Uh, so this is a Remax website, but there is no MLS in Belize. So I, I don't know who owns this website or what, um, or what they're planning on doing with it. Looks like it's, it's agents on the mainland. They were able to capitalize on the on the domain name, but this is not an MLS in any way, shape, or form. So if you go back one more time, and I'm, I'm, there's a point I'm making here that I think you're going to enjoy. So here's one, uh, MLS Ambergris Key, all right? So you may think, well, this is an MLS. What this is are three reputable, reputable companies, uh, Barry Reef Realty, Ambergris Seaside, and Sunrise, that do a, a good amount of business on the island, they decided to partner up. And so you'll find uh, listings from all three of these reputable real estate companies on Ambergris Key. And if you go, and uh, they keep the site up. <coughs> but it is a MLS, but it's not an all-inclusive MLS. Where's the Coldwell? Where's the Remax offices? Where are all the other companies that also are reputable on here. Well, they're just not invited to participate, all right, for one reason or another. So there is no MLS, but even if there was, here's the thing, MLS only works in mature and developed markets, all right? Because as an example, you, you, you go to buy a property in St. Pete's, Florida or somewhere to Florida. Let's say you're moving to Florida. You're moving to Orlando. So you look up a certain area on Zillow and you're looking at all the houses. And you can see, okay, in this general neighborhood of 500 houses, these two and three bedroom homes are all built between 1985 and 1990. They all have a similar age. They're all similar style. They all come with basic services and amenities convenient to that neighborhood. So you can expect to pay between this and this for a house, all right, within reason. How do you do that in a country like Belize? We don't have two homes side by side that even 
are the same size or even built out of the same materials or even, you know, there is no gated communities in Belize. You know, some a house could be built 20 years ago or, or two months ago. So when you're looking at property in Belize, you might think, well, geez, Dennis, you know, how, how do I know I'm, I'm paying fair market value? How, how do I know I'm not getting ripped off? How do I know I'm not overpaying? Look at, just look at the websites. Do you think you're overpaying for a lot of Secret Beach for 275000 Do you really think that it's overpriced? Well, if you do, then just compare to what else has been selling around there. What can you get a property for on the southeast side or the northeast side or maybe off-grid, you know, somewhere down by Laguna Estates? So the thing is, what I'm telling people, there is no MLS, but just look at what is selling and just know that if you're working with someone reputable that does a lot of this, they make it their business, they want you to get a good deal. They want everybody to get a good deal. The seller, the buyer, the agent, they want everybody to go to, go away happy. So they're going to really do their best. And you tell you what, I'll, I'll tell you if a property is overpriced, right? And there's a lot of stuff that I don't promote because it is overpriced and it's just way, way out there. Like I'm talking like I wouldn't even consider that because it, it really is a ripoff, right? So I'll tell you that up front. But there is no MLS in Belize. Now, the second thing that, that we need to overcome is, is it a developing market or is it a mature market? And what I mean by that is it depends on your timing and when you're looking to build, when you're looking to go vertical, when you're looking to invest or flip or whatever, that you, know, you should be looking at a market that is mature, that everything is in place. Or you should be looking at something in the path of progress. And I'm going to be kind of getting into that here as I answer your questions. But again, watch out for the old, outdated, and inaccurate info on the internet. Realize that right now, uh, Belize is seeing a huge supply and demand issue. Uh, inventory is very limited. Agents are scrambling for more inventory. And once I come back from answering a few of your questions, I want to talk about the issue of financing and why that's very interesting for those of you who are investing in Belize right now. All right, so let me take a drink of water. And if you got questions, pop them in the chat box and uh, we'll go from there. All right, okay. Any questions on what we've covered so far regarding MLSs, regarding um, property values? Okay, very good. All right. So the issue of financing. A lot of questions coming in right now. And a lot of people that I'm getting on Zoom calls with are saying, Dennis, prices where I live for homes are going through the roof. They are, they are insane. Almost everybody I talk to in the U.S. and Canada is experiencing this. There's a shortage of homes. There's multiple offers coming in on homes. As soon as something is listed within three or four hours, there's you know 10 offers on it above asking price. And so you might be thinking, well, why is that able to take place? Number one is that people are able to go to a bank in the United States, put 20% down, get a loan for four and a half, five, five and a half percent, you know, maybe even less than that. But they're able to do that and finance that house for 30 years, all right? And there might be multiple lenders, multiple banks that you could work with, right? So for example, if I see a house in the US, I wanna buy the house, I write an offer, boom, I can go to several banks, get the loan, I know it's gonna close in 30 days because it works like clockwork, right? This is something that they do this. The machine that exists for the sale of real estate in the United States is just massive. And the banks know what to do in the case of a default. And they do, they do as much as they can to protect themselves with credit checks and everything else. But at the end of the day, if the bank takes back a certain amount of homes, they have a system for moving those homes off the books so that the banks don't get in trouble, all right? In Belize, it is completely different, all right? So first of all, in 15 years of selling real estate in Belize, I've had exactly two clients use bank financing in 15 years. Most sales are cash sales or we look for someone that's offered seller financing. Now, why is that? Well, the banks in Belize loan on property with a minimum of 40 to 50% down payment, all right? So you're not gonna get away with 10, 15, 20% like you are in North America. It's gonna be 40 to 50% down payment. Interest rates are 10 and a half to 12% or higher, all right? So in addition to the high interest rates, a lot of times they're gonna charge you points on the mortgage, right? So you gotta pay some up upfront points in the mortgage. You have to take a life insurance policy out on yourself in case you die, 
that the mortgage is paid off. Why? Because the bank doesn't want that home back. They don't have a system like we have in the United States. The bank's going to get that home back and go, now what am I going to do with this home? I got to pay someone to maintain it. I got to try to find a buyer. Uh, I, I just don't want to deal with this, right? So right now, property values in Belize are at the limit that the market will bear for cash sales, all right? So if you want to come down to Belize, if you're looking to buy a you know, a, a $800,000 beachfront home or a one or $1.5 million home, you're not getting financing on it. You're writing the check, right? You're actually taking out, you're taking out the old checkbook, $1.5 million to buy the house because there is no financing, right? A lot of times now what people are trying to do to get in the game is, is what I recommend is trying to find, uh, trying to get your start with land. At least with land, you can normally find a seller willing to finance it. So a lot of times you, you hear me refer, refer to like a 10-10-10 program, 10% down, 10% interest for 10 years. All right. And even at that, you're going, wow, 10% interest, that's a lot more than the four and a half I pay in, in North America. Yeah, but you know what? No credit checks, no points, no going through the bank system here. It's just reducing balance loan. And the best part is, is if you do turn upside down, for example. So for example, let's say you bought a property from us and you've been making payments for six months or a year and all of a sudden you lose your job and you, there's no way you can make the payments. So well, number one, uh, we're going to work with you. We don't want you to see you lose the property, right? Because then we just have to get it back and sell it again, start all over. So we're going to work with you on it. But also, if for some reason you just have to make the phone call and say, Dennis, I got to walk away. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm over my head. This monthly payment is a burden. I just need to walk away. If you do that, that's all that happens is you walk away. You lose the property and what little bit of money you had put down, but that's it. You walk away. There's, there's no uh, blemish on your credit report. There's no reporting of this to the IRS or any sort of financial entity. You walk away, doesn't affect your credit. And guess what? When you get back on your feet, come on back down, let's do another deal. Because if you wanted the property in the first place, you probably wanted to get in the future. So that's the way we're dealing with it right now. Now, here's the thing that you might not have thought about. Right now, prices in Belize are being kept at this peak because it's based on the cash market. No financing is available. What happens when there is attractive financing in Belize? What do you think will happen to property values? You see, there's a reason why in the United States right now, home values can be what they are. Uh, average median home price is what, like 275,000? The, the only reason it can be that high is because that's what people can afford to put down as their down payment and make their monthly payments, right? Now, the more attractive you make the financing, the higher the prices can go. You remember when they came out with financing for universities and colleges. The goal was, hey, we're going to give kids an opportunity who don't have money to take out a student loan to go to college so they can start their lives off with, with a higher education. What happened is almost immediately, all the university prices went through the roof because they could charge more. Same thing with cars. I just looked at this today. Uh, back when I was growing up, you know, the, the average car loan was three or four years, maybe five years. Now the average is six, seven, or even eight years. Why? Because car prices have gone up so much that with that financing in place, now it's taking you eight years to pay off a car when it used to take you three or four. All right, so here's, here's what's going to happen in Belize. Once you find someone able to come in and offer attractive financing. I mean, in other words, financing like we, what we find in the United States with 15, 20% down interest rates, you know, in that four, four and a half, five, five and a half range, something in there, we are absolutely going to see a massive increase in prices. Right now, we don't know when that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. But for those of you able to get in now, it, it's, it's good. So don't worry about that little 10% you're paying. And remember, that's a reducing balance loan anyway. Right, So you can use that financing for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, but that allows you to get in the game now. And that's, that's something really important to think about. Getting in the game now, prices are the same now, and then you know worrying about uh, building later on. So now, with that being said, let me get to, uh, to some of your questions. All right, on a, uh, so Leroy, thank you very much, Leroy. So on a 10-10-10, can I pay down the loan sooner instead of having to do the entire 10 years? So yes, absolutely. So for example, you're right. Um, you put the 10% down, all right? 
and then you just make monthly payments. So for example, you can make the minimum monthly payment. So let's say that that minimum payment is $300 a month. You can do that. And then at certain times of the year, when you have extra money, let's say you get a year end bonus at the end of the year, you get a tax refund, you have an extra thousand bucks. You just call up the, the loan holder and say, look, I'm gonna put an extra thousand on top of the 300. That extra thousand is gonna go right to the bottom line and reduce that balance down. And now you've just saved yourself a bunch of money in interest, right? So yeah, you can pay that off anytime. There are no minimums. We don't write that in there on purpose. So for example, if you were negotiating, so here, here's, here's the flip side of that. Let's say you were negotiating a deal and you said, well, you know, I'm, I want to negotiate because if I'm financing, the seller's going to make some money over time. And you think, you know what, I'm going to tell him that. So he accepts a lower price and then I'm just going to pay it off in five or six months. That that's kind of being dishonest. So we wouldn't recommend that. Um, so that's why we don't put those clauses in there, but we just trust that, Hey, you know, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, 10, 10, 30, 10% is typical being put down because typically the agent fees in Belize are 10%. So that allows the agent to be made whole. He goes his happy way. And then the uh, the seller just takes over from there and starts receiving the, uh, the monthly payments from the buyers. So we have a question here from Laura and Bruce. We are just not comfortable buying anything sight unseen and have never been to Belize yet, planning a trip in the fall. Do you find great numbers of clients buying without having been to Belize? So uh, yeah, Laura and Bruce. So for example, since last, well, when the pandemic hit uh, in March, so March, about March 3rd, through when they opened up, about 70% of our sales, um, this is my personal sales, 70% were to people who have never been to Belize, weren't even able to fly down to Belize, uh, but with the on-ground team that we have, taking ground videos, drone videos, Google Earth Maps, you know, um, you know, seeing my YouTube channel, people that have bought before and own in these areas, maybe some personal referrals, absolutely people feel comfortable buying sight and seeing. Um, I like it like this. If you were to buy stock in Apple, right, or if you were to buy stock in Tesla, you don't necessarily have to go and visit uh, the Tesla factory or go to Apple headquarters, all right, because you can get enough information you need and you can get reports, you can see the value of the property. You can see what it looks like even because of drone and everything else that we have these days. And you can talk to people who are on the island. So if you wanted to pick up a deal, so for example, you're not coming down until the fall. If you want to wait, 100% back you up on that. I never, ever recommend somebody do something that they're not comfortable with. But that being said, if you find something today and you say, wow, you know what? That that's That's a good deal. That would work for us. Go ahead and buy it. The worst that could happen is you come down in the fall and go, ah, oh, you know what? This isn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, ask me to sell it for you and I'll sell it and you can buy something else. But yeah, yeah, a lot of people do buying sight and seeing, not only sight and seeing, but without even having been to Belize. And this is not just small properties. Uh, I sold properties to uh, Canadians, Europeans, and uh, a couple from uh, England, uh, beachfront properties. You know, they paid quite a bit of money for it and never set foot in the country. But, you know, like I said, we try to provide enough information that they can make their buying decision um, Anyway, so with financing, uh, here's a financing question. Do we need to use a Belize bank? Uh, yes, Leroy, Belize banks are very, very difficult to work with. And when I say difficult, they don't make it on purpose difficult. Their goal is not to be difficult. But there are so many hoops to jump through to get a to get a loan, for example, on a condo or a home. You're much better off to look for someone who is selling with seller financing or a developer who is develop, who is uh, selling with developer financing, or to try to find some way to fund it uh, through a home equity loan, pulling money out of your self-directed IRA, 401k, something like that. So um, that, that's my answer on that. Um, here's a question from Michael. Michael asks, will pricing on goods such as groceries for services like restaurants, bars rise as the population of the key increases? You know, in, in 18 years, Michael, I've never seen that. I, I, even at the major restaurants, like the Blue Water Grill, I think I pay the exact same for a salad or a pizza or a filet mignon there as I did when I first visited in, in 2002, 2003. I have not seen prices increase at all on the key um, as more and more people come. I, I have, I've not seen that at all. Um, we have booked a trip to the key. Here's a question uh, from a viewer. We have booked a trip to the key next April and when I look at some of the land available, 
Do you think that timing will be too late to find a good deal? You know, no, absolutely not. It's not going to be too late. There's always going to be opportunities. And whether or not it's at the same price next April as it is today, you know, all, all pricing is relative anyway. You know, whether or not you could have got it for 5000 or 10000 or 50000 cheaper, you know, a year ago, still, you got to look at what's available today. And, you know, for example, for you, I would recommend, look, if you're serious about, you know, buying land in Belize, um, make a make a three-day trip down. Come down on Thursday evening, stay Friday and Saturday, hook up with Israel, tour for, for two days, go back home on Sunday night, right? So you're literally, you got a four-day trip with flights included. It's enough time to see the island. Then make a buying decision. You know, if, if the cost of the trip, first of all, the cost of the trip will be nothing compared to what you could be paying next April, but it would just give you that comfort level, right? That, okay, I, I see what I like. I know what I want. Even if you don't find something on the trip, at least you've come down and gotten a lay of the land so that if something comes up between now and next April, you can give me a call or give someone a call and say, look, this is the property I want. I want to make a move on it, make an offer. Here's what I want to do because you've seen the area before. All right. Um... Okay, don't answer. I, I don't understand that question. I have to get with you on that later. A um, couple more questions. <laughs> dead, dead serious. Um, okay, so here's a, here's a question from Wayne. Ah, good to see you, Wayne. Thanks a lot for, for joining us today. Appreciate that. So uh, Wayne Walter says, if a person is flipping land, what associated cost should they be aware of when selling? The 10% real estate fee, anything else, question mark. All right, so here's a good question. So let's say you buy a piece of property and you get it titled in your name and then you wait a certain amount of time. Could be right away, could be a year or two, whatever it is. Uh, I would suggest most people wait at least till some development takes place in the neighborhood where you bought uh, so that prices rise just above natural appreciation but they actually have some forced appreciation. For example, if you're buying a property near Secret Beach and you're buying a property that doesn't have road access, let's say you're buying a property for $55,000 today. By the time you pay your stamp tax or closing costs, you got $60,000 into it. So if you got a property sitting there that you just paid sixty dollars for, has no road access yet, right? No power in the area yet. Maybe there's not any homes built around there yet. If you just wait for one thing to happen, that makes this property now bump up to the next level. What could that be? Could be a road coming in close to it or nearby it. Could be somebody building a home on an adjacent lot. A big one could be power coming in. That That is now going to give that property a huge boost, all right? Put it back on the market. Let's say you put it back on the market for $70,000, $80,000. $80, the cost that you have now as the seller, the only cost you have are the agent fees. The agent fees in Belize are 10%. 5% on the buyer's side, 5% on the seller's side. But in Belize, uh, the seller pays all real estate commissions. So if you're buying a property from me, I'm getting paid my commission by the seller, right? You as the buyer are not paying my commission. The seller pays commission. And you're saying, oh my goodness, 10%. You know what? It is 10%. We don't have the volume uh, that you do in the United States and Canada. So in the United States and Canada, it might be 5 or 6%. But guess what? You guys are selling multiple homes a month in Belize. We do a lot of advertising. We do a lot of work. And the sales funnels that we have to go through in order to get a sale to shake out at the bottom is just tremendous. I've explained this before. So 10% is the rate. That is the only cost you have associated with. You don't have any other fees on that as the seller, Okay. So it really works out to be just about equal for both buyer and seller. If you're a buyer, whatever the purchase price you see, add 10% to that price, 8% stamp tax, 2% closing costs. So 10% to the purchase price as the buyer, that's your total off the door price. And then as a seller, you take your list price, your sales price minus 10%, that's your net. All right, so it's, it's about equal. So both parties are paying 10%, 10% to the seller, 10% to the buyer. All right. So let's see, more questions are coming in. How easy it is to work there? Uh, do you have to start your own business or can you work for someone? Okay, so Belize is one of those countries that it is very easy to work in Belize. When I say easy, if you find a company that is willing to hire you, perhaps you have a skill that uh, they can't find locally um, and, and they need your skill set, right? 
that company can apply for your work permit. They can sponsor you. You can work in Belize. Or if you open up your own business, all right? And you got to look into different types of businesses. But oftentimes, if you're opening up a business that is employing local Belizeans, if you're creating some economy for the country, very, very easy to do that. Another thing you might want to look at doing, and this is what I recommend to all my clients, is trying to find something that you can do online, all right? Something you can do as, you know, coaching, counseling, consulting, uh, web design, teaching English online, whatever it might be, try to do something online so that you're not counting on earning Belizean dollars. You know, try to try to earn U.S., Canadian, Euros, British pounds. You know, try to get your income coming in from other countries uh, that you can sit on your computer, you know, watch the sunrise in Belize and, and listen to the birds sing as you're making money. That's the best way to go, right? So to try to make it about living in Belize, that is probably the number one challenge uh, that my clients are having, especially if they're not retirees, if they're younger, where they need some income. So if you're moving down, you're younger, you're, you still want to work, you're able to work, or maybe you need to work, you need to make some extra money to fund your life in Belize, it, that is a challenge to come down to Belize because you, you're not able to take jobs away from local Belizeans. You wouldn't want to do that for one, but also the pay scale is much low, much lower, and it's just very difficult, right? So if you want to open up something like a cafe, restaurant, that's going to generate a, a lot of revenue in you know, good areas, up-and-coming areas that gets a lot of traffic, that's your best bet, or just try to do uh, something online. <coughs> um... Here's a question from Cassandra. Thanks a lot, for Cassandra. This is a, this is a good uh, question. This is something new. Uh, Cassandra says, we can't find any information on the Belize Investment Residency Program. I understand it's an investment of 250000 U.S. Is that on one land purchase or an overall investment certain period of time? Cassandra, I'm with you, all right? So I am an investor in Belize, and I've invested a lot more than that. And um, I can't get a straight answer. It's something new, but from what I understand from talking to people is that if you invest in 250000 into real estate, and I don't know if this is one home, one condo, multiple properties, that you are granted, and I think it's a, a one-year, uh, basically like a one-year visa, a one-year stay. So it's not a permanent residency as I understand it. Now, that one year might be able to be converted into some sort of permanent residency, but I also have no clear answers on that. Um, and I'm not able, I, I've been trying myself to get clear answers. I think it's so new, just like this new program that Belize is launching, this work from where you vacation program, where they want to attract digital nomads down and give them some sort of visa, some long-term visa. That's all in the works. Right now, it's not been detailed as far as exactly how the program will work, but that is something that the Belize government is mindful of, is attracting people that have online businesses. They want to promote this, just like other countries do, like Georgia and Estonia, and I think it's Barbados, some of the other countries. They're actually you know, putting out the, the word like, hey, we want you to come. We want you to work online because you're going to spend your, your rent money here. You're going to buy property. You're going to you know spend your money at all of our restaurants and, and everything. So this is the way I think Belize is going to try to attract a, a younger crowd in addition to the QRP program, which has been in, in place now for, for several years. All right. <clears throat> Just going to grab a drink of water, guys. Thanks a lot for uh, for the questions. Here is a question from Patty. Patty says, are there public boat ramps on island for people who have to store their boat on their property and not in the water? So there is. There, there are a couple of different areas that you can launch a boat. It is not as uh, popular in Belize uh, to have public boat ramps like we have in, the, in North America. But there, there are boat ramps for, for smaller boats. A lot of times people have their boats hauled out at the uh, at the main marina in Belize, or excuse me, on Ambergris Key. Um, so for example, if you're only on island two or three months a year, and when you leave, you want your boat hauled out and put on dry dock, you would just take it to the, uh, to the local marina. They would do that for you. Um, a lot of people don't have boats on trailers like we have. There are some, but very, very few. And those would tend to be much smaller boats. You know, talking, you know, 16-footers, 18-footers, flat-bottom skiffs, things like that. But you're not going to see, you know, 
uh, your larger Four Winds or Sea Rays or, or Boston Whalers being trailered around. First of all, it's just just hard. You know, the roads aren't that good in Belize. So to, to sort of travel around and put your boat in the water like for a day like we would in North America, probably not going to be doing that. Uh, but yes, there, there, are, there are boat ramps that you can use. Uh, here's a question. What is an example of a developer who finances? Are there companies that do this or is it individuals who do this? All right, so that's a great question. So an example of a developer who finances would be someone like um, Mahogany Bay Village. All right, so Mahogany Bay Village, uh, which you're probably very familiar with if you've been watching any of Will Mitchell's videos, and I highly recommend that you do. Will's a good friend of mine. He does a fantastic job at highlighting the lifestyle on Emigrus Key. So Mahogany Bay Village, it, it consists of the Hilton Curio Collection Hotel and also several other smaller projects, including the opportunity to buy canal front property and then have your own home built. So for example, right now, the, the parent company of Mahogany Bay Village is selling canal front lots for 150,000 US and they are financing those. So they, they themselves, the developer, is financing those lot purchases. So I think it's something like 20 or 30% down. And if you put 30% down, they'll, they'll drop the interest rate a bit. All right. So that's one example. There are, are also some lots available in Grand Belizean Estates, developer-owned lots, where the developer will actually offer the financing. And I think on those, they might be offering like a 20% down 30-year mortgage on those. So that's one example. Another example might be, for uh, example, the um, uh, Las Terrazas project. When that project was built, the developer of Las Terrazas was actually offering limited financing, all right? But once a project is sold out, right, now what you need to look for is owner financing. So for example, let's say I owned a condo at Grand Caribe, bought a two-bedroom condo, paid for it, it's my name. Now I want to sell it for some reason. Maybe I don't go to Belize anymore. Maybe I'm, I'm back home for some reason. I could choose to sell that condo for cash or... Um, if I wanted, I could also sell that with seller financing. Now, seller financing isn't as popular with improved property because of a couple of different things. First of all, if I own a condo at Grand Cree worth 650000 first of all, I'm probably going to want more like 20 or 30% down. Uh, but second of all, I don't know how people are going to take care of that condo while they're financing. You know, what happens if I come down? What happens if I default or they default? And all of a sudden I come down and I find that, you know, it wasn't cared for, for property. They got mold problems or whatever the case might be. So I'm going to be really hesitant about taking a very valuable piece of property and just letting someone, uh, owner, you know, seller financing it, right? Same thing with a house. With land, I'll finance land all day long because there's not much someone can do to, to, to mess it up, right? So land, you'll find people willing to offer financing on. But with improved properties, you really got to look. And oftentimes, it's for a lot shorter um, financing windows. So for example, again, going back to this illustration, if I own a condo at Grand Caribe, 650000 I'll take 25% down. I might give you a 10-year mortgage, but I want to be paid out in the next 24 months, 36 months. And you might be thinking, well, you know, that's, you know, I need financing. That's not financing. That's like real short term. But the, here's the thing. A lot of you guys looking to buy a property in Belize have plans to sell your primary residence in the next year or two or three years, right? Or they they are planning on inheriting a property or maybe they have a secondary property that they own that they're going to be selling. So they can say, okay, <clears throat> I'll buy this condo for $650. i will put down 25% now knowing that in 24 months, I'm going to get this large chunk of money in. I'll be able to pay it off and everything is good. So you can normally structure deals like that. But it's, you're going to be hard-pressed to find condos or homes for sale that are 10, 15, 20-year mortgages. They just really don't exist. All right. Here's a question. Um, question from Jeff and Heidi. Hey, guys. Nice to have you on today. Jeff and Heidi are uh, great uh, investors of ours. So they asked the question, when buying land and flipping, uh, having Belize Key Investments, Alberto and staff hold the land titles while you're offering financing, what or how does Belize Key Investments let you know they have let you know they received your land title? Um, are there any websites you can use to look up your land ownership once land title is official? Okay, so very good. So 
So the question is, as I, as I understand it, Jeff and Heidi, is if you're buying a property in Belize and you're using Alberto for your closing, um, when when will you be informed that your actual physical title has gotten back to them from the lands department? So here's the process on that. When you buy a property in Belize, there there is a, a pretty long closing prop process, especially compared to North America. So in Belize, it typically takes 60 up to 90 days to close a property. What happens during that time is on day one, the contract is turned into the closing company. So the buyer and seller both agreed, here's the price, here's the terms, that goes into Alberto's office. Now what happens is Alberto and his team, they start to collect due diligence from the buyer and seller. So copies of utility bills, copies of passports, um, other forms that need to be filled out. And uh, then, you know, as we get closer to, to, to doing the closing, there's closing statements that are signed off on, there's last minute due diligence, and then when you get an email from Alberto and his team saying, this deal is closed, congratulations, what that means is that entire package of information has been now registered with the lands department in Belmopan with the government of Belize. They get a, a number, an LL, uh, L letter of registration number, and that number, once you have that number, that means that your closing now has been registered with the lands department. Now, what does that mean? You are the legal owner of the property. Now, what the lands department does is they now have to go through all that due diligence, look at everything, and what they need to do is process that. Now, the lands department is a very, very small team of professionals working, and they can only flow through so much processing. Now, Alberto and his team, they can, they can keep sending the paperwork to the to, to lands department. The lands department eventually is just going to have stacks and stacks of, of processing to do, but the property is yours, right? So as soon as that is turned in, the property is yours. It might take four months, six months, or nine months for you to get the physical title, but the property is your property, all right? So just because you don't have physical title. Now, if you want to check on this yourself, just ask Alberto and his team for the LHS number, you can call Belmopay and Lands Department and say, hey, please check on the status of this for me. They'll tell you. There's no website uh, that you can look that up on, but they'll tell you where it's at in the process. Um, but once Alberto's office gets the physical title back, they'll call you. They'll say, hey, look, do you want us to hang on to your title? Do you want it FedExed? How do you want us to handle this? Because that title is very important. That's your original title. But you've been the legal owner as soon as that package was registered with the Lands Department. All right, did that answer your t your question there? Um, let's see. Yep, there you go. <clears throat> okay. Charles Roberts. Uh, thanks for the question, Charles. Are there any plans in the future to allow property owners the ability to pay their property taxes online? It seems like a simple thing, right, Charles? Belize, you know, it's amazing because Belize needs money, right? So the San Pedro Town Council needs money. And I'll just be honest, they do a horrible job at collecting taxes, all right? There, there's some people that haven't paid taxes in five to 10 years. And it's just that they don't have a good system for sending out tax bills. I mean, they do, they do send them out, but the whole collection process and making it easy. So what I've learned is that, look, Alberto pays all my property taxes. I probably have 40, 50, 60 properties uh, that I pay property taxes on. Some of them I've sold that I get reimbursed by the buyers. But anyways, they charge a small fee. I think it's like 25 or 27 bucks. You know, send send Alberto the bill. He gets the bill. He pays it. He charges 27 bucks for the uh, for the hassle. Pay your taxes like that. Or just pay your taxes when you come down uh, next time around the island. Walk in the San Pedro Town Council. Here's, here's my number. Here's my personal number. What do I owe? And you give them the cash and you go on your merry way. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. All right. So yes, we do hope that they get an online system, but for right now, they, they, they don't. Um, here's a question from Sandra. Sandra Tarasov. Uh, when buying waterfront uh, or an island, are you able to build a pier and or structure over the water? All right. This is a great question, Sandra. So uh, the laws and regulations on pier building are are managed by the local municipality. So for example, right now in on the island of Ambergris Key, the San Pedro Town Council is the one that issues pier permits. And right now there's a moratorium on east side permits. Now why why would that be? 
the, there is a there, there's certain scientific studies that have been done that show that the dredging that needs to take place when building a permit, you know, upsets the sediment that has an effect on the reef. So Belize, again, it is very mindful that the reason why people are coming to the island is for the crystal clear waters, the sea life, the lobster, the conch, the snorkeling, diving, fishing, that they protect that reef. So from time to time, they'll put moratoriums in place. Now, right now, I know for a fact that when you go north on Everest Key, there's long stretches where you can go for miles without seeing a pier. Obviously, you are going to be able to apply for and get a pier permit to access your property, right? So they're not, they're not saying no more piers. On the west side, it's a different story. <clears throat> the west side has very, very few piers, but they do try to limit it. They try to space them out. So you don't automatically get a pier on your property just because you own beachfront property, but you can apply for one. Most likely you'll get it if there's not a pier too close to, the, to your property. Uh, now, as far as building over water structures, all right, that's that's completely different because that is now taking it to, oops, taking it to the next level, all right? So there are very strong regulations now on what you can build. So here's the thing, remember, guys, you don't actually own the beachfront, right? Beachfront is considered queen's land. So the pier would be yours if you, if you had a pier permit, but that beachfront property is open to the enjoyment and use of enjoyment of anybody, uh, anybody who wants to. So um, keep that in mind. But as far as building an overwater bungalow, restaurant, bar, that's that, that takes a lot of hoops to go through. I would not plan on that. Um, but you can see that all over the island. So obviously there, there, there are people getting permits for those. It just takes going down there, investigating, pitching your idea, showing how it's going to benefit the area, not detract from it, how it's going to not uh, hurt the wildlife that lives in the area, things like that. All right. So Samson, are you referring to a small island in the lagoon? Yeah, if you were to find a small island in the lagoon, Sandra, I don't think you're going to have any problem at all building a pier. If you want an overwater structure on that, again, you're just going to have to look at look at the actual property lines. And I, here, here's an example. If you're buying an island uh, in, in, in the lagoon, your island, so to speak, might be a quarter of water anyway, right? So your, your property pegs might be underwater in a certain area. So obviously you can build over water there or appear there to get out into deeper water. But again, that would be something to work with your developer on or your builder or maybe someone like Ursel. Ursel would be a great contact to, to, to find that out. Um, some more questions. And thank you very much, Sandra. Appreciate the question. Uh, hope I wasn't too confusing on that. Um, here is a question. Here is a question from Parrish. She says, he, she says, I recently closed on a Punta Azul a lot. I was a little surprised by the amount of the property taxes. I was expecting them to be cons uh, considerably or significantly lower they aren't prohibitively high, but higher than expected. And they are more than what I pay on a larger but similar value piece of land here in Michigan. Is that typical? If you would, Parrish, let me know in the comments what, you, what your property taxes were um, in the uh, Punta Azul South subdivision. See if you're still on, if you can put that information in there. Most property taxes on the island for an off-beach property range between $75 to $125 a year. Beachfront properties range between $150 and $250 a year. I haven't seen anything over that. Um, but if, if an area has been reassessed for some reason, property taxes might be a bit higher. But yeah, um, I mean, especially for vacant land, you're looking at usually extremely low. Um, just looking for more questions here. Okay. Give me a second, guys. Just kind of look through and thank you by the way for all these questions this is really good it was either 225 or 250 for a third robot uh so question on that was that us or belize dollar prices so the invoice that you got from the san pedro town council take a look and see um if, if it's an invoice from the san pedro town council that's that's uh belize dollars um it wouldn't surprise me if that area has been uh, re reevaluated and your property taxes were two twenty five or two fifty. That would make sense for me on that. Um, yeah, more more than maybe what they have been in the past, but certainly reasonable. But yeah, let, let me know if that's Belize dollars or U.S. dollars on that when you get a chance. So let me just kind of go back and just to kind of close out a few things 
that I wanted to talk about because I said that I wanted to give you some examples of some properties uh, that we had available. So let me just do that now and then we'll go back to answering some questions. So this, these just came in from Israel today. So this is Secret Beach area down here. This is Pirates Bar. This is Paradise Bar. This is Casanova Cabanas that sits right here. So this is the road that comes up now to access all these properties. So what we have is a second row lot, 65 feet wide of width by 200 feet deep. So it's like a double lot. And it is priced at, um, let's see, uh, $165,000. All right. So it has a, a direct beach access road right here. So it has road access. It, uh, it's a double lot, again, 65 by 200, uh, 165,000. We also have this 1.3 acre parcel right here. Uh, that's one of the rare, uh, larger parcels. You see most lots here are much smaller. This is a 1.3 acres for 175,000. All right, we also have uh, these properties here. There's four properties, uh, two on this side of the road, two on this side. Their parcels number 83, 17, 83, 18, 19, and 20. These are going for $55,000 a lot each. These are uh, cash-only prices. In fact, let me just mention that to you. These properties here, the second row, the 1.3 acre, these are cash deal onlys. Uh, this, these four lots here at $55 apiece, those are cash deal onlys. And there are some lots, though, that do come with seller financing. And let me just um, let me just show you where these are. One is not too far from Secret Beach. We'll just pull up the Google Earth overlay map. By the way, these two lots here did sell. Those are now under contract, so congratulations on the sale of those. This lot here is under contract, so we congratulate those owners. But let me just go back to um, the Secret Beach area. So this is Secret Beach where the road dead ends. We have a lot right here. It is parcel number 7224. It does come with financing, 10, 10, 10 program. And from there to Secret Beach, it is probably, I don't know, half mile, 0. 0.41 miles. All right, so a lot of you guys have been asking me about properties that come with seller financing. This is one of them, 0. 0.41 miles to Secret Beach, and it's 35,000 with 10, 10, 10 financing. Uh, what I also have are two lots in the Paul Maya Wood subdivision. I think it's this lot here and this lot here. They're not side by sides, but they are two individual lots. Those are also 35,000 a piece with a 10, 10, 10 financing program. And from these lots here over to Secret Beach, you're looking at one mile, so 1.02 miles. All right, so those are a couple of deals I wanted to tell you about today. Um, Let's just go back to some questions. All right. All right. Yeah. So send me, send me the um, pair. Send me the uh, the closing statement, and uh, I'll take a look at it for you, and uh, and then we'll go from there. All right. Appreciate that. Let me go back to my share screen. And I know I'm going kind of long here, guys. It's been going an hour and twenty minutes. So hoping not, uh, hoping not boring you. Let me just kind of get to some other information. Uh, yeah. There we go. So um, to answer your question, this is something I had pulled up. What's the date on this? The date is. Well, that can't be right. Date's 2013. This is an old bill. Anyways, check on this because this is, is $300, the property taxes on this beachfront property. Uh, but again, that's that's Belize dollars, so it's 150 US. All right. Uh, email me if you have any other questions. Let me just kind of go up and... So, PRP... Yeah. Yeah, guys, I think that's about all I had for today. Um, okay, keep going. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's take a question from Ileana. Ileana says, how difficult is, is it to set up an offshore bank and would you recommend it? All right. So let, let's tackle this issue of banking right now for a few minutes. All right. So first of all, the question is, should you set up a bank in Belize, an account in Belize? If so, why? First of all, if you're only buying property in Belize, let's say you're buying your land now or you build a house, 
and you're not living there, then there's no need to get a, a local dollar Belize account. Now, if you come down, like the couple I had on a Zoom call today, they're actually moving to Belize. They got a couple kids. They're going to live in Belize full time. Uh, they're going to be, you know, paying electric bills, internet bills, uh, maybe some staffing, things like that. They're going to be wanting to be able to write checks in Belize dollars. All right. So they would want a Belize bank account. Now to get that, <coughs> you have to be a resident of Belize. So you can't just open up an account if you're not living there, if you're not a resident. But the benefit to having that is now you got an actual Belize dollar account. So you can get a debit card with that and, you know, pay for things all over the country with a Belize dollar account. That's one way to open a bank account in Belize. The other way to open up a bank account would be go to a, a true offshore account, all right? So this isn't necessarily a Belize bank, although the bank physically exists in Belize. But for example, if you were to open up an offshore bank account at KeyBank, spelled C-A-Y-E, KeyBank, they have an office right in San Pedro Town. That would be an alternative to your bank account in North America or England or somewhere in Europe, all right? So that would be a place that you could open up account. You can either do it in your personal names or an entity like an IBC. There you could hold US dollars, Canadian dollars, British pounds, euros. You can't hold Belize dollars there because that, that it's an offshore account. So for example, if you want to park some money outside of North America, outside of the realm of, you know, U.S. banks, limitations of U.S. banks, or if you want to protect some of your assets against litigious lawsuits, let's say somebody comes after you in the U.S. and, you know, they sue you, uh, you know, you've got these entities or these holdings outside that are protected, all right, they can't go after those assets, right? So that might be one reason to open up a bank account at KeyBank. You can also set up family trust through there, different things like that. I recommend that you get a hold of a, a contact by the name of, uh, Luigi Waweji, and let me know if you want his contact information. Uh, great guy, and he'll be able to walk you through the pros and cons of setting up an account at KeyBank. And again, if you're planning on making Belize home, all right, then I would definitely set up an account at Belize Bank. Now, which which leads us to the question of taxes, all right? So, what is the deal with taxes? Got a lot of information for you guys on this. It's going to take a lot more than this webinar. So, people always ask. <coughs> Sorry, let me grab a drink of water here. People always ask, what are my obligations to the U.S. government or to the Canadian government if I buy and own property in Belize, if I'm running an Airbnb? So here's, here's the, the, first of all, there's two major distinctions between you and me. You, who might be living as an American citizen, living full-time in the U.S., having the United States be your domicile, that's where you are living, your tax obligations and the way you report taxes and your income is going to be completely different than me, who is an expat. I file different forms than you. I come under a completely different tax structure than you. So for example, if I have a, a rental property in Belize and you do, we're going, the government of the United States is going to look at that a little bit differently, right? Depending on, again, how you take the income, how is your entity set up? Do you own it in an IBC? Where's the money going to and from? How do you pay yourself? Are you taking, um, you know, dividends? Are you paying yourself a salary? You know, how are you benefiting from the income? Same thing with properties. Let's say you buy and flip. You start to buy and flip these lots. You buy and flip for cash. You buy and flip with financing. Where's that money going to? How are you reporting the income? What type of income is it? So for example, what I would suggest a, a lot of you guys do is go to an, uh, somebody who specializes in expat uh, tax filing. So for example, here's a company called Tax Samaritan. I pulled this up just before I got on the webinar today. <coughs> and I use a tax preparer. Uh, I use several tax preparer. One, one in France. I have my Belize, uh, you know, the, the, what Belize does. Plus I have one in the United States, in Miami. Uh, that, that handles my taxes. But for example, if you get this, this is a free guide. This is a good overview that I can send to you. But if you look through it, it talks about if you're an expat. So if you actually physically move to Belize, you leave the United States, you leave Canada, you leave Europe, and now you are making Belize your domicile. Now, again, you, you come under a completely different tax code. All right. So here's some basic questions. Do I have to file taxes? If I make over under a certain amount, how do I tax? What if I 
own my home in Belize? How, how does the U.S. government, you know, view that as far as if I'm making payments? How do they view the interest? Uh, what if I'm running an Airbnb, Airbnb and, and part of my income is through rental income? Um, you know, what about a, the foreign tax credit, which I've heard so much about? How much can I make and legally not pay any state or federal income taxes? Or when do I have to pay business taxes and Social Security? All right, so there, there are a lot of moving parts and because things change often, you know, from year to year, I would recommend you just, you know, set up a, a, a consult, consultancy uh, with one of these companies that specialize in offshore taxes, especially if it's your goal to actually move abroad. All right. Because then there's going to be some things that you want to set up in place, especially with structures of ownership how to receive the income, where to put the income, how to report the income, because you want to be, uh, in, in my experience, 100% above board uh, with anything government related, because you never want the shoe to drop, all right? That's just going to come and bite you in the butt later on down the road. So as far as it depends upon you, get yourself educated on this. And the good thing is, it's all in our favor, guys. Uh, you know, when you when you physically leave the United States or Canada, I'll give you an example. Um, I work with a web developer uh, from Canada, and he's making, you know, uh, let's say $100,000 a year working in Canada. When he physically moves to Belize and makes Belize domicile, he's no longer being taxed at all in Canada, and he's not paying any taxes in Belize either. All right, so imagine that massive bump. For my U.S. clients, it's something a little bit similar. If my U.S. clients are, are paying are making $100,000 a year in the United States on an online job by moving to Belize, most likely now they're only going to pay some Social Security and business tax, which is around 14 to 15%, instead of the 40 to 42% they're paying now with their state, federal, everything else included. All right, so there are some massive benefits to living outside of North America, especially if you're uh, operating your business online. But um, again, that's, uh, that's a, a topic for an entire webinar, but there are resources that you can go to online. What I would recommend, if someone wants 100 bucks for an hour of their time or 200 or 500, you know, get on a phone call, get on a Zoom call, talk to one of these guys, say, hey, look, here's what I'm planning on doing. Give me some guidance, right? And that way you, you come down to Belize fully armed with some uh, good information that you're going to need to uh, to maximize your tax benefits, all right? So make sure you're not paying too much. All right, so let's see. Uh, here, here's a question. All right, I'll ask it. Um, the Belize dollar is pegged to the to the U.S. dollar at two to one. All right, uh, what happens to the Belize dollar when the U.S. dollar becomes worthless? Uh, which is why I went out of the USA. Great question. So right now, Belize has chosen to peg itself to the U.S. dollar. So you're right. Two Belize dollars equals one U.S. dollar. There's there's a small point percentage point in their difference when it comes down to reality, but you know, let's just say it's two to one. That's that's by Belize's choice. Belize can choose to unpeg itself, right, from the U.S. dollar if it wants to in the future, if it needs to, right? So that's totally on the Belize government. So it has full control of that. But right now, it's still at two to one. Um, I'll be reaching out to you shortly. Thank you so much. Um, dun, dun, dun. Mm, 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 mm. You know, questions about Airbnbs. I've done I've done entire webinars on those, so I'm going to recommend that you that you go back and watch those. Um, what I can say is that. Just just do your homework, you know, do your homework. Look at a website called Air DNA. Go to Air DNA, pay the few bucks that they want for the research. It's it's awesome information. All right, guys, it's just incredible um, because they show what people are searching for, what's renting, how much it's renting for. All right, and I guess let me wrap up with this today about Ambergris Key, guys, because people are looking at Belize and, you know, Belize is a small country, but they have some ideas on where, where they might want to live. So a lot, of, a lot of you guys are looking at other places on the mainland. You're looking at Corozal, Placencia, Cayo District. So the big major denominator, the, the big reason why Ambergris Key is so different is because it has this, this built-in clientele, this repeat business that other parts of Belize just don't have. For example, 
Ambergris Key is a diving destination. Always has been, always will be. So for example, you have people that dive, they will come back to Belize year after year after year, and they'll tell you, hey, I'm going diving in Belize, right? So they'll come down, they'll go to the islands, maybe go out to the outer atolls, they'll go diving in Belize. Or they're, they're, they're fishermen, they like to fly fish, go after the bonefish, tarp, and everything else. So they'll tell you, I'm going down to Belize fishing, right? I'm making the fishing trip. That's the reason. Those kind of people are what we call repeat clientele. They come back to the island every single year, every other year, maybe multiple times a year, and they make up a large part of the repeat business on Ambergris Key. Now compare that to an area like the Cayo District, okay? Beautiful jungle, you have the Mayan ruins, but you're not gonna hear someone say, um, hey, I'm going down Mayan ruin touring you know, to Belize again. Once you've done it once, you've done it. Once you've gone cave tubing once, you've done it. Once you've gone zip lining once, you've done it. You don't come back to Belize year after year for those types of experiences. Now, yeah, you might do them two or three times because when family comes, friends come, you wanna go do that with them. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if you own an Airbnb and it's, it's somewhere like Corozal, Placencia, Cayo District, San Ignacio, there is a lot of money spent, advertising dollars spent in order to um, get, get an overnight booking, right? So you got you to gotta put out some ads, you got to spend a lot of time to get a person to come down to spend three or four or five nights or a week in your Airbnb in those areas. Now that person will probably never come back again, all right? They might recommend a family member, but even then it's kind of iffy. But they've done that now. They stayed in those areas once. They're probably not going to be repeat clients. Ambergris Key is a different animal, right? There are people that come back every year and they will stay in the exact same Airbnb, the exact same hotel. They might even re re request the exact same hotel room or the, some exact condo. Why? Because that's where they feel comfortable. It's like coming home. They'll go snorkeling, diving, fishing. They come back for that reason. So when you guys are thinking about this, you know, as far as a, an Airbnb being having a financial return, remember, Ambergris Key is very different than other areas. It has that built-in clientele. And if you notice, that is where also the name brand hotels are building. They're not building on the mainland. They're not building on Key Cocker. They're not building a Placencia. Why? First of all, they don't have the flow-through traffic. They don't get the amount of physical bodies, the tourists going into those areas. Placencia, as beautiful as it is, doesn't get the tourism Ambergris Key does, right? So you're not going to find the larger hotels going down there. You don't have people going down there in mass. You don't have that in Kyle and Corozal. You do on Ambergris Key. So for example, right now you have the 220 room hotel called the Hilton Curio Collection. It's there for a reason. And the Hilton has a built-in clientele. People that stay at Hilton's, they'll stay at Hilton's all around the world. If they go to Shanghai, if they go to Beijing, if they go to, you know, wherever it is in the world, Paris, if they're Hilton people, they stay at Hilton's. Now, interestingly, the Alaya Marriott just opened up last week. They just had the grand open. And the Marriott also comes with its own built-in clientele. People get Marriott points. People stay at Marriott's, right? They're loyal to the brand. And so when you see big name brands coming in, we're going to see more here in the next probably 12 to 24 months. Um, they haven't been announced yet, but they're coming, right? So when you see these brands that should tell you something. Number one is why is the brand building here and not somewhere else, okay? The, these brands come with massive amounts of thinkers that have analyzed the market, they've looked at the numbers, they've done the projections. You know, the, you know these are you know, $800 an hour lawyers that are doing these deals. They're investing millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars into a project. They don't do that unless they're very certain that there's gonna be a, a large payoff. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is that when you guys are looking at buying a $35,000 lot or a $200,000 beachfront lot or something like that or building a small Airbnb, it should give you the comfort level like, okay, people are coming here, right? People are looking for inventory when they come. Now, maybe my three or four casitas won't do as much revenue as the big Marriott, but there's not a lot of people that can afford the prices at the Marriott either, or they, they might not want that experience. People oftentimes are coming to Belize, they don't want the big resort hotel experience. They want the local feel. They want the mom and pop place. I get a lot of people say, Dennis, I, I could go to Cancun or Palm Beach, Florida and be in any resort. I don't want that feel when I come down to Belize. Now, those places 
like the Wyndham Grand and the Marriott and the Hilton, they're going to fill up just based on their, their own advertising and marketing dollars. But a lot of people like you and I, when we come down, we want to wake up to a real Belizean breakfast, right? We want to have the, uh, the, 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 the tacos. We want to have the salbutes. We want to have the Johnny Cake and the Fry Jack, the real Belizean feel. That's why I think a lot of you guys who are looking at building local places, even smaller places, if you guys get good reviews, if you guys offer something special, and it doesn't have to be on the water, can't be too far away, but you know, if you guys offer something special, for example, let's say you bought one of those lots in um, you know, Grand Belizean Estates or Palmyra Woods, right? And maybe that's what you can afford at this time. So you build something, you, you build some casitas, maybe you have a pool, you know, you provide some kayaks, maybe a little kayak trailer where you can uh, take by golf cart your kayaks down to Secret Beach. Maybe you offer that to your renters or some bicycles, or maybe you offer them a Belizean breakfast. The experience you're going to be able to provide is just going to be awesome. Now, those people most likely would come back to stay with you because now you're friends. You just spent a week with these people. They've gotten to know you, the dog, and everything else, right? So that's where Ambergris Key has a, a real opportunity. It also has opportunity with niche markets. For example, if you're building in one of the areas that are more isolated right now, then you go after markets like you know those who like to fly fish or those who are into, I don't know, just all sorts of small niche markets. You go after those, you advertise to those on Facebook, Instagram, you get a following. Here's the thing that I want to talk to you guys about, YouTube, all right? A lot of you guys know me from following my YouTube channel, but why isn't, why doesn't every Airbnb and restaurant and cafe and beach bar have a YouTube channel? They think that Facebook is, is the big marketer, Instagram. Those are fine, man. You know what? Facebook, I can post a video on Facebook and somebody watches it and tomorrow they forgot about it. You post a video on YouTube. So imagine this, all right? Imagine you own a an Airbnb, right? And, you know, you get up in the morning, you got your little iPhone and you're walking around the property. And if, if your guests agree, maybe you say hello to them, you wave hello, you show the dog, you show what you're making for breakfast, right? You show sundowners, you know, you say everybody gathering around at night, you know, drinking some wine and having fun, maybe a rum punch. What if you post a video like that once a week, right? So over a year, you got 52 videos of your property. And maybe at the end of the end of the stay, you uh, you offer to the guests, hey, you know what, you know, um, would you mind just doing a, a one or two minute, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting blown up here with with, um, <laughs> with uh, WhatsApp messages. Um, what if you just say, you know what, would you give me a, a short two minute, you know, video? Now, here's the thing. Everybody posts reviews on, uh, you know, um, Airbnb or TripAdvisor. But what if you had just a little video, you know, of your guests saying, man, we we had an awesome time. We went we went swimming at Secret Beach. We went snorkeling. We went out to the reef. You know, imagine the, the amount of eyeballs that would get as you have a following, right? And then how much more additional traffic that would bring. Even, even great restaurants. You know, my favorite restaurant on the island, Blue Water Grill. Fantastic. Highly recommend it. What if they had a YouTube channel? Now, what they have is a live camera feed. Right now, you can go to YouTube, type in Blue Water Grill live feed, and you can see the ocean right now. It's a live 24-7 feed. But what if they had a YouTube channel where, you know, you have the owner of Blue Water Grill or maybe the host or hostess or bartender a couple times a week showing them making some cocktails, showing the dishes they're making, showing sushi night, showing the restaurant filled with people. You know, that YouTube is so underutilized right now. And I'm telling you guys that because this is a tool that you can use too with your own properties. So for example, what if you bought a, a beachfront property and you said, you know, what? I'm going to document my experience. Uh, I'm going to show the property that I bought in its raw native form. I'm going to show the land prep, working with the designer. I'm going to show the designs, the builder. If it takes a year or, or two or five years to have my full dream uh, come to fruition. And what if you, you developed a following so that now over, over time, you've got a thousand people or 5,000 people watching on YouTube. And now you put that thing on Airbnb and you want, you want people to come and book it and talk about a marketing tool, man. I know I, I went off on a, a rant there, but that's what you guys should be doing. All right. Looking for that because nobody's doing that right now. Guarantee it. Nobody's doing that. All right. What other questions do we have that have come in? Uh, uh, okay, here's a, a question from Daryl and Angela. Hey, Gibsons, I was just going to mention you guys. If any of you guys 
uh, want to follow a real-life couple who are in the middle of making their Belizean dreams come true, uh, go to YouTube and type in Texpats in Belize. Not expats, but Texpats. I think it's T-E-X-P-A-T-S. Texpats in Belize. Uh, Daryl and Angela are documenting their um, their entire process. The good, the bad, and the ugly, all right? Which I think is fantastic because you know what? Um, there's good points to Belize, there's bad, and there's ugly, and there's everything in between. So these guys have a great YouTube channel, and uh, I just love them. Please subscribe, uh, give a big shout out, and uh, and watch them because this is going to be the real deal. There's a couple showing how they found a property, how they purchased, now they're going to document their entire thing. Fantastic. See, uh, good to see you guys. So their question is, they want uh, they want someone to clear the land, and they're looking for builders do you have a guy, all right? And have a guy is in quotation marks or a list of references we can trust. Yeah, absolutely. So what you guys can do, um, just go right to Israel. So Israel is a great guy. He can take care of having the land cleared for you. I also have a good friend named Wilbert Acosta. He has a team that can do that. Um, it depends. If you're looking at building, you know, getting ready to build right away, um, then I would recommend maybe you work with a builder where the builder's own guys come, they clear, they scope it out, they look at it, see what you can do where. But yeah, uh, Israel's your guy on that, Daryl and Angela. So you can uh, you can absolutely trust him. And congratulations on uh, and getting back to Belize uh, real soon. That's fantastic. Let's say uh, a couple other questions. Um... Oops, did Owen comment? And I, did I miss your comment, Owen? Um, let me just look through here, guys. Here is a comment uh, from Raul and Tahika. He says no road access on any of the lots, right? Uh, it depends. Some of the lots that I just talked about did have road access. So the ones for 35000 with financing all had road access. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, do you need an engineer? Um, you mean to, as you're, as you're designing your house? So there's a couple of different things you can go with. And I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about an architect or someone that's designing your home. So there's a couple of things that I would do. First of all, you can hire an architect, someone actually to design your home, get the plans, have them approved by the San Pedro Town Council. Uh, or you can work with someone like Ursel Martinez, who's not a licensed architect, but he can do all the plans he works with a licensed architect that they can do all the, the approvals and stamping and go through like that. Um, there's a couple of different ways to look at that. So uh, we can talk about that more in detail. Um, here's a question. Very rough, at rough estimates. When I think road access will hit Punta Azul South. Um, yeah, you know what? Since I have a lot of my clients on here who, uh, who own property up in that area, let me just go to my Google Earth and, and show you this. In fact, I, I can take this opportunity to tell you about some other areas too that I think are in the path of pro progress. So for example, uh, well, let's just kind of go down to San Pedro town. We'll start at San Pedro. So here's San Pedro. You come in, you fly, you get off the plane, you get on your golf cart, you drive north. So you drive north about three and a half, four miles, and you're going to reach the Secret Beach turnoff. So that's right here. As you continue going north, you're gonna find that there is an area right here that is a, uh, a government subdivision that was recently subdivided, entitled, and allocated to local Belizeans. So those of you who are looking for very affordable prices, I'm talking like in the 35 to 37 range for road access property with internet, cable, and um, electric, I will be looking for anything along this road right here. So right now, I'm pretty sure if you guys email me, say, Dennis, I would take any lots you have around along this road for $35,000 cash. Um, I, I know I could get you some. So let me know. This is a great area. But going further north, you're going to reach the Habanero subdivision, which is right here. And this is where Daryl and Angela own. And the road going north basically ends in, basically in this area. So... Again, Google Earth is not 100% accurate on this. I guess some of the road here has been uh, has been grown over. I, th I think it's maybe this road has been grown over, so you can't access this property with this road. But you see the road had some white mall put on it, 
and they stopped it right about in this area. So to go past this subdivision, you go to the beach and there's a golf cart path. You can actually see it here on Google Earth that goes up to access these properties up in this area. All right, this here is um, uh, El Secreto. You go up a little bit further. This is the Punta Azul South subdivision right here. But you see the road has been roughed in. Now the reason that that has been roughed in is because this is where the utilities run. So the utilities for cable, internet, electricity run all the way up to the Jimmy Buffett's property, which is sitting right here. So this is the property that's being developed as a Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. So the power comes up to here and then extends a little bit further up to Tranquility Bay, which is right here. So the question was, when we think road access is going to continue going north, maybe up to, say, the Punta Azul South area. So to answer that, first of all, let's see approximately how far it is. So from Punta Azul South to the road, we're looking at 1.2 miles, all right? So a mile and a quarter that this would have to be finished off. Now, what would incentivize the government of Belize or developers to put that to put the rest of that road in. All right, so first of all, if we go back and look at where Margaritaville is, and I don't know, I haven't talked to the owners or developers of that property regarding this, but their property is here. So from their property down to where the road currently ends, it's 3.12 miles. All right, so what is the, uh, I'm still I'm still going live on this one. If anyone did do the math for me, what is what is twenty five dollars U.S. times? Let's see how many feet this is. Times sixteen thousand four hundred. So somebody do the math. Twenty five times sixteen thousand four hundred. Twenty five dollars U.S. running square foot is what was recently paid to have the secret beach road extended from here up about a mile. All right, so it's about a. It was about 125,000. So maybe you're looking at somewhere, maybe around $300,000 or so, maybe 325, 350. It really depends. But there, there will be an incentive to get the road access to Jimmy Buffett's. First of all, for all the property owners there, uh, but also for all the tourists. All right now, they'll be bringing everybody up and back by boat, which will probably continue. But just to be able to say, hey, you know what? You can come up by boat, but if you rent a golf cart, you're going to be able to bounce around and go to other places uh, by golf cart. So when do I think this will happen? I don't really have a crystal ball and I can't really project on that. But I would say once Jimmy Buffett's opens and I'm going to take a guess it's going to open up the end of 2022. I would say sometime around then we're going to see the, uh, the construction on this continue. Also, what you got to remember is that there are property owners up in these areas, there are beachfront lot owners. There are other owners that want road access. And like what we saw happen at Secret Beach, they're going to be getting with other owners and putting up their own money. If you own, let me just you know, put this out there. If I own a, a, and this is a real life deal, by the way. If you own a property, a beachfront property on Amherst Key, a $1.6 million estate, and the road is literally, you know, not too far away. And for 50 grand or 75 grand, you can have the road put in. You're going to put the road in, you know. So you're, you already got a hundred and, you know, $1.5 million investment. You're going to pop down another 50 or 75 or whatever it is to get the road in just so you have access that's going to benefit everyone else. Or if you have a pro couple property owners. Now we know for the average person, right, who's probably viewing this webinar, you don't have the means, you don't want to put, you know, put out 50 or 100 grand. We understand that. That's why we say for, for us, for the, the common folk like us, we are buying in properties that have road access or very soon are going to get road access, right? Like all those lots in and around Secret Beach. And we are going to see a lot of roads going in in the next um, eight to 12 months at Secret Beach because there's a lot of people going vertical, a lot of people are having roads put in, and we're going to see a, a tremendous boom of activity in and around that area. All right, uh, so we got 47 people on, 410,000, thank you, Leroy. So $410,000, let's say as an estimate, is what it would cost to get, to get the road from where it dead ends now all the way up to, to Jimmy Buffett's, all right? Um, it's not much, man. And what that would do 
to the property values. If I own property up there, if I own one of those 10, 12 acre parcels, if I own beachfront, um, I will be thrilled to pitch in and get that road built because that's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty, uh, pretty special once it does. All right, here's a, a question from John. John says, can you bring your own plans to the builder and have the builder get the stamps and permits needed? Absolutely, yeah, you know what? There are so many, um, uh, so for example, if you're an architect, John, or if you wanna work with one in the United States and you wanna have some plans drawn up, brought down, absolutely, that's 100% acceptable. Do that all the time. Just keep in mind that what you build in Belize should look a lot different than your North American home, right? Because there's a lot more things in Belize that you're going to want to think about. You're going to use the property in Belize different, right? So as an example, you're probably going to spend a lot more time outside because of the weather. You're going to be want to be out in the sun. You're going to be grilling out more. You're going to be doing things. But during the heat of the day, you also want some areas under the shade, right? You don't want to be in the direct sun all day. So you're going to think, okay, if I built my house with a morning veranda where I want to sit out in the morning, you know, knowing that the sun comes up and this direct, direct it's going to be in my face, you know, how big do I want my overhangs to be? Or, you know, if I want to watch the sunset for my veranda or my deck, you know, uh, how much of it do I want shaded? How much do I want open? Should a part be screened in? Uh, you know, there's all these things you got to think about in Belize. So what I would recommend is, you know, absolutely work with an architect where, you're, where you live, whether it be United States or Canada, but also definitely get the input of, of a local builder because a local builder is used to using the materials they use. They have a lot of, they, they've done this before. This isn't their first home build and they might be able to offer you a lot of insight as far as things that you might not even have thought about because maybe you haven't lived in a tropical country. So maybe there's building materials or way of creating flow through and draft so you have some airflow in the home so it's not just stagnant, right? So all these different things uh, so yeah, you could absolutely work with your own architect, but I highly suggest you also get the input of a local as well. Um, you have to go. You know what? <laughs> I have to go too. It's been uh, it's been two hours. I'm starting to lose my voice. You could absolutely rewatch this later. Uh, I appreciate it. All you guys attending today, and uh, thank you so much. All right. So listen, if you got more questions, we're going to be doing this again. Thanks a lot for watching today. I appreciate everything. And again. Um, if you would like to put offers in on any of the properties that we talked about today, uh, let me just go through them again, just very, very quick. Um, I just had, oh, I had one screen. Just take a screenshot of this. All right, so here's the properties. Take a screenshot of this. Uh, 7224, 35,000 with financing. Uh, the two Palmyra Woods properties, 35 with financing. Secret Beach, these four parcels, 55. Punta Azul South Beachfront, 250. With a 10 10 30 with a 10 year balloon, monthly payments are 2000 a month. Laguna Estates, sorry, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that, but we got a new listing coming up 185 10 10 30 with a 10 year balloon, monthly payments of 1461. And there was one more. Oh, yeah, these two. All right, second row lot for 165, 1.3 acres for 175. Those are the best deals I have right now. If you're interested in any of those, just let me know and we'll uh, try to get you in your own slice of paradise. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day. Good evening, good afternoon, and we'll hope to see you in Belize soon. How do I end this live? <laughs> That's it, guys. I'm going on long enough, man.